is a conservative and libertarian lawyer group that is founded on the basis of preserving the current legal order. It's founded on the principle that the state exists to preserve freedom, the promotion of separation of powers, and that judges should say what the law is and not what it should be. And we're joined today by Professor Jonathan Adler from Case Western Reserve Law School, uh, who's traveled to Las Vegas to speak with us on an area of his expertise on global warming and environmental regulation. Um, some information about Professor Adler is uh, that uh, he teaches environmental and constitutional law, among other areas, and has a particular interest in property rights. He's the editor of several books on environmental policy and over a dozen book chapters. His articles have appeared in publications ranging from Harvard Environmental Law Review and the Supreme Court Economic Review to the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post. Uh, media appearances include Fox's O'Reilly and Hannity, ABC News, CNN, and interestingly, Entertainment Tonight. Maybe he can explain that. <laughs> He's a regular contributor to uh, internet blogs such as uh, National Review Online and the Bullet Conspiracy, for those of you who follow that. Uh, he's been noted as one of the most cited legal academic academics in environmental law under the age of 40, and a recent article was nominated as one of the 10 best land use articles in all of 2008. Uh, he has clerked for David Santel, judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia, and also was at the Competitive Enterprise Institute. His bachelor's degree was from Yale University, and his law degree was from George Mason University. And Professor Adler, as I mentioned, uh, in the mid-60s till 2001, my father was a professor at Yale while you were there, and he had, was a professor of meteorology. And he researched and did work in carbon dioxide and atmosphere and global warming way before this was a sexy and politically exciting topic, when it was just science. And he used to come home every day from studying the intricacies of carbon dioxide and the atmosphere and how it affected global warming. And all I can say is he never once was alarmed. He never once said the world was going to end. He was much more interested in how the Mets were doing than anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that, for what it's worth, that's the voice from the front. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I think the Mets lost last night. Um, I guess I, I, I have to explain the entertainment tonight uh, uh, reference. Um, early in my, my career doing environmental policy, I uh, got sent some materials pointing out that a lot of material that's produced for children isn't always the most accurate. Um, and I you know, was writing things about the Clean Air Act, and for those of you that do anything with environmental law, the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, not, not, not always the most stimulating material. And uh, so the chance to write some you know, little piece you know, talking about why you know, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles are, are saying things that, that are, are uncontroversially wrong. I mean, things are just flatly factually incorrect about you know, whether or not uh, polystyrene contains chlorofluorocarbons or things like that. Uh, I thought it'd be that fun thing to do. Uh, at the time, there was a, a popular cartoon called Captain Planet uh, on, uh, on TBS. And so I wrote this piece about called Little Green Lies. And it, it summarized 10, 10 things that were common in a lot of environmental things aimed at children that were inaccurate. And you know, I figured I'd then just get back to the other work I was doing. But I didn't realize that you know, once you pick a fight with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, uh, people start paying attention. And so next thing I know, Newsweek is quoting the, this little paper I did. And, and Entertainment Tonight wanted me to, to come on and, and uh, explain why it was that I would, I would dare say something uh, horrible about the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles' efforts to educate our children about the environment. So uh, that's, that's what got me on, uh, on Entertainment Tonight. And I think it's been all downhill from there. But um, <coughs> uh, what I want to talk to you about today is uh, uh, the issue of climate change, and in particular, climate change policy. Uh, and what I want to uh, suggest is that uh, what we are in the process of doing, uh, and maybe doing more of, is embarking on a very ill-conceived uh, costly and counterproductive set of policies designed to deal with the threat of climate change and in particular to regulate emissions of greenhouse gases and, and that it's really time to fundamentally rethink uh, how we're approaching this issue. Uh, what I should also say at the outset is I'm, I'm, my talk is operating under the premise that climate change is real, that human activity contributes to it to some degree, 
uh, and that uh, this could create some problems. Uh, I happen to, I accept that premise, um, uh, but uh, and, and certainly there are those that, that do not. Um, but my point is that even if we accept that premise, even if we believe that climate change is a very serious problem, even if we accept uh, what Al Gore says uh, about uh, the, the degree of, of threat that climate change poses, and ignore the house he just bought, um, and its energy consumption, or energy consumption. Um, there is hard to justify the things that we are required to do under current law, or will be required to do under current law, and hard to justify the things we are talking about doing. Uh, and that taking this issue seriously doesn't justify those steps. Uh, and um, so I'll do that, uh, hopefully do that uh, relatively briefly so we can have time for questions and, and some discussion. Um, what is the place to start in terms of what we're doing and why we're doing it? Uh, there is uh, about now 11 years ago, a little organization called the International Center for Technology Assessment filed a petition with the Environmental Protection Agency asking them to regulate greenhouse gases as a pollutant under the Clean Air Act. Uh, on the basis that uh, emissions from motor vehicles contribute to pollution that causes, uh, or emissions from motor vehicles cause or contribute to pollution that can be reasonably anticipated to endanger public health or welfare. And uh, time EPA didn't respond. Uh, eventually, after several years, EPA eventually was forced to respond uh, to this petition and denied it. And then that prompted some litigation. And by, by the time of litigation, this little, uh, this little organization was joined not, by, not just by a lot of other organizations, but also by several states, uh, including most of the states in New England and California. Uh, and they eventually filed suit trying to force the EPA to regulate greenhouse gases. And as some of you may be aware, in 2007, the Supreme Court made a decision called Massachusetts versus EPA. A uh, decision that I think, as a practical matter, is probably the most consequential uh, Supreme Court decision uh, of the last 10 years uh, held uh, that, in fact, the Environmental Protection Agency uh, had authority to regulate greenhouse gases under the Clean Air Act, even though the Environmental Protection Agency uh, did not believe it had such authority, uh, and even though there was no evidence that any member of Congress thought they were giving the EPA that authority when adopting the Clean Air Act, uh, and then also that Massachusetts uh, and others had standing to sue EPA over climate change, uh, and that the reasons that EPA had given for not trying to act, even if it had authority, were invalid. And this is significant for a couple reasons. One, it was significant because uh, there was a lot, of, uh, a lot of reason to believe that Massachusetts and private plaintiffs couldn't establish Article III standing for climate change. Uh, and the court uh, said that, certain, that states did and that potentially private parties did as well. And for those of you who have followed this, we now have, uh, since Massachusetts versus EPA, uh, public nuisance suits in the Second Circuit and in the Fifth Circuit, where both circuits have held that plaintiffs alleging injuries from climate change, even injuries far off into the future, uh, establish or, or <coughs> can meet the requirement of Article III standing. We'll talk about that in the discussion there. Uh, uh, time. Those, those are potentially very significant. But in holding that the Environmental Protection Agency had the regulatory authority to uh, over greenhouse gases and to treat them as pollutants, the court, for all practical purposes, required that the Environmental Protection Agency treat greenhouse gases as pollutants uh, and regulate them as such. And that sets into motion a whole bunch of things that are quite significant. Uh, the first of those is uh, under what, what the litigation was actually originally about, what's called Section 202 of the Act. I'm not going to throw out a lot of section numbers for those of you that don't do environmental law. Um, uh, you're probably uh, not very familiar with the Clean Air Act, and, and you're probably happy about that fact. Um, <laughs> but Section 202 of the Clean Air Act is the provision that is the source of all the various tailpipe emission standards that we have for motor vehicles. And the way Section 202 is, is structured is, is that if the uh, administrator of the EPA uh, can reasonably anticipate that emissions from motor vehicles cause or contribute to pollution uh, that, co that could endanger public health or welfare, e EPA is required to regulate. There's some interesting things about this provision is because initially the standard that the EPA has to meet is actually not very rigorous. It's not very demanding. 
Uh, a lot of times the debate over climate change is you know, whether or not it's going to be apocalyptic, whether or not it threatens civilization or not. The standard in the Clean Air Act is nothing like that. It's whether the, the administrator can reasonably anticipate that these emissions cause or contribute to pollution that can have negative effects on public health and welfare. And welfare is defined under the Clean Air Act to include just about everything. Effects on plants, effects on animals, effects on climate, effects on, on weather, effects on, and it, it doesn't have to be even direct effects on people. And that's a very easy threshold to meet, uh, especially if we're talking about something like, like greenhouse gases. The EPA has made a finding, uh, EPA Administrator Lisa Jackson has made a finding, I think it would have been a finding that would have been very difficult for her not to make after Massachusetts versus EPA. And so now the EPA was then required, having made that finding, to regulate. The, the, the act is not, this part of the act is not discretionary. The EPA is not allowed to say, well, yes, you know, these emissions cause or contribute to this pollution, but we think the costs of regulating would be greater than the benefits. We think that regulating the automobile fleet in the United States to try and deal with global warming doesn't make any sense because a lot of emissions come from stationary sources and even more emissions come from outside of the United States. The United States is not even the biggest emitter of greenhouse gases in the world anymore. Uh, China is. Uh, those would be reasonable arguments one might want to make. The Clean Air Act does not allow those arguments uh, under Section 202. Uh, so the EPA has now promulgated regulations that will increase uh, the effectively increase the fuel efficiency of automobiles and reduce uh, CO2 emissions by about 20% uh, over the next decade or so. Um, and that's what the Massachusetts for CPA dealt with directly, but it doesn't stop there. Because the same language that's in Section 202 of the Clean Air Act is in other provisions. Provisions that relate to stationary sources. Provisions that uh, relate to what are called the National Ambient Air Quality Standards. These are the air quality standards that every metropolitan area in the country has to meet. And we usually think about these standards applying the smog or applying the particulate matter. And uh, we kind of understand how they operate. The federal government has the standard, and Las Vegas has to meet these standards, and Cleveland has to meet these standards, and New York has to meet these standards. And the way they do that is working through the state. They come up with a plan about how they're going to make sure that local or regional air quality for the pollutant in question is going to meet that standard. How exactly do you do that with someone that's dispersed globally? Carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases just are dispersed globally throughout the atmosphere. They only have effects on climate that we could be worried about because of their global atmosphere concentrations. It's not meaningful to talk about local or ambient concentrations. And it's something you can't control in a local or ambient way. But yet, Section 109, uh, Section 109 and the other provisions related to national ambient air quality standards require the administrator of the EPA to set a standard for pollutants that come from numerous sources, that's easily met, for greenhouse gases, that cause or contribute to air pollution that can be reasonably anticipated to threaten public health or welfare. It's the same standard. If the EPA is required to do this for motor vehicles, they're going to be required to do this for, national, for uh, national ambient air quality standard provisions as well. And in fact, there is a petition with sitting at the EPA right now from an organization that's not shy about litigating the Center for Biological Diversity, uh, seeking to force the EPA to set these standards uh, as well. But that's not all. There are other provisions uh, the Act uh, that deal with what we usually refer to as Prevention of Significant Deterioration, or PSD. These are provisions that deal with large industrial facilities. What we usually think of kind of the major stationary sources, the, the sorts of things we usually think about when we think about air pollution. Uh, and then the provisions of the Clean Air Act called Title V, which are, are kind of broad permitting provisions for stationary sources. These provisions require uh, the adoption of standards and the application uh, to facilities for any pollutant that is otherwise regulated under the Act. So now that we are regulating greenhouse gases under Section 202 for motor vehicles, these provisions have to be applied as well. And this is really kind of interesting because these provisions were written to deal with, again, as I mentioned, the big, large, you know, the, the coal-fired power plants, the large factories. There are several thousand facilities in the country that, that are subject to these provisions right now. And they apply to any facility, depending on the type of facility, that either has the potential to emit 100 tons per year of the pollutant in question or 250 tons per year. Does anyone know how many facilities or buildings in the United States have the potential to emit over 250 tons per year of carbon dioxide? Any guesses? What's the number? 
right, assume right now that, that under 10,000 facilities uh, are, are, uh, meet this threshold for regular, for traditional pollutants. EPA estimates, and there are reasons to believe this estimate is conservative, that applying the 100 and 250 potential to emit standards to greenhouse gases, to carbon dioxide in particular, will increase the number of facilities that have to be permitted under Title V 140-fold. A study done for the Chamber of Commerce trying to estimate the numbers, and again using fairly conservative methodology, estimates that there are over 1 million facilities in the United States, including churches, restaurants, apartment buildings, malls, certainly uh, most of those large uh, properties on the Strip that have the potential to emit, because that's the standard, more than 250 tons per year of carbon dioxide. The EPA has looked at this, the current EPA has looked at this, and they have said this is not feasible. Uh, they said that there is no way that they can do this, even though the Clean Air Act says specifically there is a, the threshold is 100 or 250 tons per year. And it's interesting you're saying it's not feasible because one of the arguments that was made to the Supreme Court in Massachusetts versus EPA was that one way we know that the Clean Air Act wasn't written to deal with greenhouse gases is because there are provisions in the Clean Air Act that if you try to apply to greenhouse gases, they just don't make sense or they can't be done. I gave one example already, the idea that, that you could have a localized air pollution control plan to deal with the globally dispersed pollutant. The Supreme Court rejected, categorically rejected that argument that there's anything incompatible with the Clean Air Act and uh, uh, the regulation of greenhouse gases. So what's EPA supposed to do? Well, what they proposed doing is they proposed invoking the rarely used doctrines of administrative necessity and absurd results to pretend as if these numerical thresholds of 100 and 250 tons per year are actually 25,000 tons per year. That was their initial proposal. Uh, since then, it's been reported that, that they are preparing to finalize a rule that's going to treat the numbers 100, 100 and 250 in the statute as 75,000 tons per year, explicitly on the grounds that they don't know how, how otherwise they could ever process the number of permits that they would be required to process by the clear text of the act. Now, I'm certainly willing to accept the idea that there are lots of times where regulatory statutes aren't very clearly written, Certainly a lot of times where we have to give agencies a good deal of discretion in figuring out how to apply the language of those statutes. But I would submit it is hard to find an example of an agency taking a numerical threshold in a statute and, it, and without statutory authorization by administrative fiat changing the number because it didn't think it could do it. Um, I had a student that's looking at this and, and she has not been able to find a single case where you had something that late. Um, uh, doctrines like the absurd results doctrines are often invoked in cases where, for example, I mean, applying a traditional tort doctrine would require someone to do something that would threaten human life or something. We say, well, that would be an absurd result. Clearly, clearly that doctrine shouldn't apply that way. It's not applied in this sort of situation. But the thing that's really interesting is that we're going to do all this and it's not going to make much difference. That is to say, we could do all these things, these things are required to do, or we could, as some have proposed, replace it with legislation to adopt the cap and trade regime, or as is currently being discussed in Congress, apparently, sector specific regulation. And it's not really going to do much of anything to deal with the problem of climate change. Now, why do I say that? Well, I say that for two reasons. First of all, as I've already mentioned, climate change is, we often refer to as global warming. It's a global concern. The, we're, we're talking about atmosphere concentrations globally of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases because that's what drives the warming that people are concerned about. And if you can't reduce atmospheric concentrations and stabilize them at a level that, is, that, that will not generate the degree of warming that we're concerned about, it doesn't matter what you're doing. And so if the United States reduces its emissions, in fact, if the United States were to disappear tomorrow, based on current projections, the atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere would continue to increase because of emissions from developing countries, particularly India, China, Brazil, and so on. So unless emissions are dealt with globally, it doesn't matter. But the other thing that's really interesting is that the sorts of goals we've set for ourselves domestically, maybe we want to lead by example 
are the sorts of goals that we're not going to meet. And I say that we're not going to meet them not just simply say because I'm cynical and I think regulations don't always produce the results they're supposed to, but because no political entity is going to be willing to impose the sorts of restrictions that would be necessary to meet what are fairly modest goals from an atmospheric standpoint, but incredibly aggressive goals in terms of what would have to be done locally. So what do I mean by that? Well, the current administration has endorsed, a, a, and the legislation that's been proposed in Congress is aimed at meeting what's called 80 by 50. The idea is an 80% reduction of greenhouse gas emissions by the year 2050. Now, what does that mean? What would that mean as a practical? It wouldn't, it wouldn't prevent the continued increase of, of, of atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, but what would it mean in terms of our energy use and our emissions? Well, if we're going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 80%, we're talking about having greenhouse gas emissions approximately what they were in 1910. Let me tell you a couple things about 1910 that are a bit different than, than today that might be relevant. One of them is that per capita income was about $6,200. Other thing that's really, really important is that the United States in 1910 had 92 million people. In 2050, we're expected to have somewhere in the neighborhood of 400 million or so, 420 million. So per capita emissions would actually have to be significantly lower than they were in 1910. Best estimate, and this is kind of rough because you know, we didn't have an EPA or a Department of Energy there to measure this sort of thing back at the top, back then, but, but best estimates are this is uh, would, would require per capita emissions somewhere about where they were in 1875. Or if you want to you look at contemporary comparisons, per capita emissions equivalent to something like, say, Botswana or Grenada. And that's for a goal that can't stabilize atmospheric concentration. That's for a goal that doesn't, that is only a step towards solving the problem. To give some other comparisons, that's less than half of the per capita emissions of France and Switzerland. Why are those countries relevant for comparing? Well, one is France, for example, uses a lot of nuclear power. A lot more nuclear power than we're likely to see in this country, certainly by the year 2050, given uh, what it takes to site a nuclear facility and given current uh, current uses. Switzerland uses a lot of hydropower. Other thing that's very relevant comparing us to France or Switzerland, and this is, I think, read readily uh, understandable out here, is that France and Switzerland, like most of Western Europe, are very dense. Demographically, or in terms of, or, or, or geographically, in terms of density of population, they look a lot like mid-Atlantic or northeastern United States. They don't look like much of anything west of the Mississippi, and that has a big effect on energy use methods. has a big effect on the sorts of buildings you have, it has a big effect on transportation needs. And so uh, if we want to compare ourselves to those countries and we want to say that we want to have per capita emissions less than half of what France and Switzerland has, it not only means looking at what they do energy-wise that's radically different than from what we do, but also recognizing that their energy use patterns are radically different than ours for reasons that we don't have a lot of control over. We can't snap our fingers and say that uh, uh, mountain states and, and western states are going to have uh, the, the population density of, of Maryland. The other reason I say that, that, that these goals aren't going to be achieved here is because these sorts of goals aren't being achieved anywhere as a result of deliberate government policy. Between 1990 and 2005, global CO2 emissions increased 30-some percent, 30, about 32%. Since then, in some parts of the world, we've had some decline, but that's been because of, uh, of uh, financial, financial collapse and the economic problems we had. That's usually not the sort of policy that people would, would like to recommend for, for uh, environmental reasons. Uh, and in Europe, the, the part of the world where we often point is saying, oh, look, look at their leadership that, that, they're, that they are providing. Well, in 2008, Germany authorized 20 new coal-fired power plants. It sounds like that Germany, you can find similar things in other European countries, are actually acting as if, in fact, they're not acting as if they plan to have the sort of emission reductions that we're talking about. And we could talk about you know, China and India as well. Right? They're not reducing their emissions. Uh, in fact, their emissions are increasing as they seek to develop economically. The bottom line, and we can, you can talk about what's going on in a lot of different countries, is that 
we're not going to have meaningful emission reductions, certainly nothing approaching what would be required for atmosphere stabilization, unless one thing happens. Unless it becomes cheap. At the costs that, we're talk that are involved today, uh, no one is going to impose, no politician is going to impose those sorts of limits. Uh, and no, uh, uh, certainly no democratic nation is going to stand for it. Uh, no one wants to have the living standard or the energy use patterns of this country 100 or 130 years ago. So one thing we need to be focused on if we get climate change as a concern is not focusing on, well, what are, what are our emissions going to be in 2015? What are they going to be in 2020? What are they going to be in 2030? But recognizing that we're talking about doing something on, over a longer time horizon and that our real goal is making it feasible, making it cheap. People look for models of what we've done with, you know, with other environmental problems. People point to the phase out of CFCs under the Montreal Protocol. I say, look, we did that. Relatively easy problem. We were talking about a handful of specialty chemicals used for some important uh, purposes, but not nearly as ubiquitous as greenhouse gases. But even that step of phasing out CFCs was not done, was not accepted by the United States, was not imposed globally by treaty until we knew how to replace CFCs. Some large American companies had actually patented, DuPont had patented likely replacements. It wasn't until it was something that we understood how to do that was relatively cheap to do that we did it. And we could talk, say the same thing about a lot of other environmental problems, acid rain, the same thing. The, 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 the cap and trade program that was used for the emissions that contribute to acid rain was not adopted until we knew what sort of technologies could be used and we knew they were important. So if we're interested in this, we have to make it cheap, and this can be the last points I'm going to make, and then I'm happy to, to open the questions until I'm told to stop. But we need to focus on ways of encouraging greater innovation in the energy sector in particular, so that we could have a chance of reducing climate change in a way that would be politically tolerable and economically justifiable. How would we do that? I think when you look at the history of environmental regulation, you don't find many examples of regulation driving innovation. You find people trying. California, some 20 years ago, saying they were going to mandate a certain portion of the automobile fleet would be quote unquote zero emission, and then exempting heaters for vehicles because they realized Northern California it actually gets cold sometimes and it's hard to have a zero emission vehicle that actually has heat. <laughs> or a defroster that works. And then realizing that even with exemptions, the sales mandate couldn't be enforced, and even California was forced to back off. And there are lots of these sorts of stories. So what do we do? Well, we should be focusing on the other side of it. How do we create incentives for people to want to innovate? Again, we look at our traditional tools, subsidies and the like. We don't see a lot of uh, uh, positive examples, but there are areas where we do see positive examples. We see the patent system, certainly, that generates lots of innovation. Economists and law professors debate about is the patent system designed perfectly or not, and could you tweak it? But in a general matter, we recognize that holding out to innovators the prospect of super competitive returns, the patent system we do with, with a, a, a monopoly grant for a time period, is a way to generate a lot of investment, a lot of dispersed, decentralized investment by a lot of really smart people that are motivated by the desire to, to make a profit, for sure, but that this generates a lot of socially desirable event for innovation. Now, in the environmental context, patents often don't drive enough innovation because we're often dealing with what we call commons problems. That is to say, there's no way to capture the benefit of the innovation. If I, if I come up with a way to, to use energy more efficiently, and I patent that, I'm going to be able to capture some of those returns because I can sell that to people that use a lot of energy and, and sell them and say, look, you're going to reduce your energy costs. You can't do that with climate because where its energy is priced, greenhouse gas emissions are not. So one way we can create super competitive returns for innovation is to do what French used to do, the British used to do, but a lot of people in fact used to do, a lot of governments used to do, and only some private entities, for the most part some private entities do today, which is use prizes. Some of you may be familiar with the book Longitude. It tells a story about how the British Empire realized it needed a really good way of knowing where, of, of, of letting its ships knew where they were because 
you know, having a, being a mercantile power is kind of problematic if your ships get lost. And they figured that decided that a, that a prize, offering a giant bounty on someone figuring this out, would actually be this innovation. And not only did it do that, but it's really important is it generated that innovation from a direction that no one expected. All the really smart scientists and astronomers in, in, in Britain at the time thought that the way to, to figure out longitude was to be based on reading the stars. And it turned out that no, the way to find to, to, to measure longitude was actually going to be going to be accomplished by having a really accurate clock that didn't lose time over long voyages. And you know, a couple hundred years ago, this was actually really important. I mean, today, you know, we have matters, watches. We're not as worried about that, but at the time, this was a big deal, and no one expected it. It came out of left field, uh, but the prize uh, provided that. French military did the same thing for food preservation. Some of the early food preservation techniques that have been beneficial for lots of other things were actually invented because the French military realized that they were going to be sending troops all over throughout Europe. Napoleonic armies were going to be marching through Europe. They might not always be, be able to depend on locals to give them lots of food. And that being able to have food that would be, could be kept and preserved that the troops could take with them might actually be a good way to go. There are lots of other examples. Today, most of prizes that we see are done privately. Netflix offered a prize to have a better algorithm to recommend movies to you. Uh, Richard Branson uh, has, has uh, endorsed a climate-related prize. But the interesting thing about these, the various private prizes is that they're small potatoes compared to what the federal government can do. The federal government spends literally billions of dollars every year on climate change-related research and development. If even a fraction of that were devoted to prizes, we would dramatically increase the degree of innovation and investment in innovation in climate-related technologies. And just as an example of that, the Ansari X Prize, some of you may be familiar with, privately funded prize to have uh, a low orbit space flight and a vessel that could, that could do this, do it repeatedly, uh, spurred innovation, er, spurred investments several times the magnitude of the prize. In fact, it's estimated that the, the prize winning team that was funded by, among others, Paul Allen, actually spent more than the value of the prize because once they got into it, ego and other things uh, drove them wanting to win the prize. And so uh, this offer of, of a small prize invested, it's, it's estimated somewhere like 10 times the investment in innovation. Uh, sort of thing you can't claim that it's done with traditional R&D subsidies. Um, so prizes are something we should do. There are some other things we should do. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Cape Wind. We think finally, possibly, got its final approval after 10 years. This will be the first offshore wind farm in the United States. Uh, and, uh, but it was, when it was proposed, regulators thought, oh yeah, we could, this could be permitted in 18 months. That was nine years ago that that estimate was made. And it's still not open, it's still not being built. Um, we need to recognize that there are regulatory barriers to new technologies and that while some of these technologies may be cost, com cost competitive, some might not, it really doesn't make sense to, to hamper them uh, with additional red tape. It doesn't uh, make sense to treat an offshore wind development the same way uh, we would treat an offshore, say, oil development. The risks, such as they are, as we know from recent events, are dramatically different. And it doesn't make sense to have a regulatory process that doesn't take account of those sorts of things. I also am in favor of, this may be a bit more controversial, uh, a revenue neutral carbon tax. What I mean by revenue neutral, it's often phrased as uh, a tax and rebate. The idea being that what we really should be doing is shifting, uh, not increasing the tax burden on the United States, but shifting the source of taxation from income to consumption. Uh, and the easiest, most transparent, least, le or, or least vulnerable, uh, and I'm sure there's some tax lawyers in the room, so I can't say invulnerable, but least vulnerable to special interest manipulation. The way to do that would be to have uh, a, a fairly straightforward tax that is fully rebated on a per capita basis. And a lot of folks, there are there's legislation that's been introduced to do that. Um, I don't think the tax, I, I wouldn't recommend trying to make that tax flow necessary to drive innovation by itself because I think that would be incredibly socially costly. I also know that politically that would never be viable. The last thing we need to be doing um, is recognizing that there is no silver bullet. There is no magic technology we can just pull off the shelf. The technology exists. It hasn't been developed yet. It hasn't been discovered yet. And there's no guarantee we will discover it. 
And so we have to recognize as well that some changes from climate change are inevitable. Uh, and that we have to be upfront about the fact about that fact and that some of what we need to do if we care about human welfare is to deal with adaptation. I'll give one example that is probably salient out here. One effect that we can expect from climate change, even if climate change is very modest, even if it's nothing approaching Al Gore's nightmares, is changing on water changes in water supply. Well, because even small changes in nighttime loads, which is the, the least controversial claims about climate change, that you, you, you raise nighttime loads, are going to affect evaporation rates, are going to affect the timing and degree of precipitation, are going to affect the rate, the timing and the rate of snowpack melt. And those sorts of changes can have dramatic effects on water resources and availability. And that's just one example of the sorts of changes that we need to have. We need to be aware that, that that may come whether we like it or not. And indeed, may come even if it turns out that climate change isn't significantly affected by human activity. And even if that were true, we do know that the Earth has undergone uh, a modest warming over the 20th century. And we would want to be prepared for those sorts of changes anyway. And that's the sort of thing we have to talk about. It's not. Uh, the top of most folks' agenda, but it is something that, that is inevitable. And lastly, we of course need to recognize that our goal should be to maximize human welfare, and that whatever set of policies we do, uh, it doesn't make sense uh, to completely sacrifice other sources of, of, of wealth and well-being uh, in, in single-minded pursuit of, of controlling one threat. You know, I think climate change is a serious concern. But I don't think it's the only concern out there, and especially when you're talking about the developing world, the parts of the world that are supposed to be most vulnerable to climate change. It's hard to say that climate change is clearly that much more important than malnutrition, disease, lack of access to safe drinking water, health care, and all the things that are killing people in much of the world today, as opposed to what will be killing them 10, 20, 40, 50, 100, 200 years from now. So those are my prepared remarks. I'm happy to take questions until Matt tells me I have to stop. So thank you very much. So questions. How long do I have for questions? 25 minutes. Okay, great. Questions, concerns, comments, objections? You mentioned CFCs and the Montreal Protocol and all. Um, I mean, that was the big environmental issue 20 some years ago. Okay. Uh, I mean, I guess proponents of the limitations, uh, getting rid of Freon, et cetera, uh, would argue that, well, it worked. And yet, well, of course, uh, we know that, I mean, my understanding is, is the so-called hole in the ozone layer at the South Pole is mainly where you see the huge growth. And that, that still happens. And so, arguably, uh, the CFC, getting rid of those, hasn't had any impact on it. And did anybody really care anyway? Because my understanding of the so-called hole is that the difference between a hole and no hole was like moving from uh, Washington, D.C. to Richmond, Virginia, as far as the amount of, of sunlight that you were getting. So, so is it just that we have a much more, a uh, lot sexier kind of environmental scare to worry about in, in, uh, with uh, greenhouse gases and CFCs? Well, let me say a couple things on CFCs. And one, there were two sorts of concerns about CFCs. And one that was clearly exaggerated was the human health of them. Right? They overall get skin cancer. Because uh, the, the amount of ozone, the, their UVB radiation exposure does vary with latitude. And the closer you move to the equator, uh, the more um, exposure there is. And clearly, we know that lots of people voluntarily move, say, from parts of the country where I live now or where I used to live when I lived in, in uh, uh, New England or in, in Pennsylvania to places that have much higher UVB exposure, both in terms of uh, uh, their latitude and, and their days, uh, days of sunshine, right? So move to Arizona, move to Las Vegas. Um, and we, we deal with those risks without much concern. I mean, I, so it was real in the sense that I, I believe that the evidence that there would be thinning that would increase exposure was there. Um, uh, and if it was a sort of thing that could be dealt with relatively inexpensively, it would make sense to do it. Um, not because we were all going to die, but because if you could relatively inexpensively uh, prevent um, uh, a significant environmental risk to being involuntarily imposed um, 
on others. It's generally, generally a good idea to do so. The other risk that was, that was always put forward, and one that was somewhat more speculative just because we don't know as much about it, was would there be ecological effects um, from increased UVB on ecosystems that, in ways that we don't understand. But the thing about the CFC phase out that I think is particularly important in the context of climate change are, are, are a couple. One is we were talking about specialty chemicals that are used in a handful of applications for which we already had a good idea how we were going to replace them when we, when we signed on to them. I mean, the reality is that the United States was not going to phase out CFCs until uh, that was the case. And in fact, didn't do so until the patents on most of the CFCs that were being phased out had expired. And uh, the, the patents were, were already, had already been filed or, or, were, going, or short, were, were soon going to be by, by for the replacements. Um, and I would say as a conspiratorial matter, I would say this is a practical matter. In fact, the big trade group that was involved, you know, that represented the CFC industry, when these things happened economically, its position went from opposing to supporting, and the U.S. then decided there wasn't significant opposition. Um, we have no clue how to reach the, reach the modest goal of 80% reductions by 2050, let alone the sort of reductions that would be necessary to stabilize atmospheric concentrations at 550 parts per million, which is a doubling of, of CO2 equivalent from pre-industrial levels, let alone the, the, the targets that people throw around of 450 parts per million, or the latest number people throw around is 350 parts per million. We have, I mean, we have no clue how you can do that. So that's a radical difference. The second thing is the ubiquity of greenhouse gases, right? We're not talking about something that's used in a handful of places. We're talking about stuff that's, that, uh, that, that are ubiquitous in any kind of modern society, not just from burning the fuel, but from you know, cooking these meals, from running air conditioners. Uh, I mean, you, you name it. I know when, when people, one of the re people were somewhat surprised when EPA estimated this 140-fold increase in facilities that be subject to the requirements uh, because the assumption was, well, you have all these, all these buildings, they get electricity, and electricity is generated off the site, and the, the, power, the power plants are already going to be covered. So how does the building get covered, too? And we just forgot about all the little things that, in small amounts, uh, generate carbon dioxide <coughs> or other greenhouse gases. And so the, the scale of the problem and the, the solution are, are radically different. And the same is true if we want to talk about um, uh, the sulfur dioxide trading program for us, right? uh, You were dealing with, I'm going to forget the number, but I think it was one of, it was something like 400 facilities over in the, uh, when people talk about cap and trade, here, and they talk about acid rate, here are some numbers to think about, right? So we know in the climate change context we're talking, even if we're just talking about facilities that emit more than 250 tons per year, we're talking over a million facilities. If we just want to talk about the big power plants, we're talking about several thousand facilities. For acid rain, when the acid rain provisions of the Clear Act were put in place, it init they initially only covered 100 facilities. By the time it was fully implemented, after five years, of, it took five years to write the rules, uh, only covered 400 facilities. So order of orders of magnitude difference in terms of the complexity of, of the problem. On top of that, the way that the EPA set the cap for the acid rain program was by looking at what technologies existed and were viably, viable economically to reduce sulfur dioxide emissions, estimated what emissions would look like if those technologies were used, and then that's how they set the cap. So there was no technology forcing in the sense of driving industry to do something it didn't know how to do. As with CFCs, we basically knew how to do what was going to be asked. So the, the things that make dealing with greenhouse gases challenging aren't there in the context of uh, uh, either the, the Montreal Protocol or the, the sulfur dioxide. But, but here's what's more daunting about this. Is my understanding would be that the reduction in the CFCs has still not had an impact on what they were trying to accomplish. Well, they have a, they have a long lifespan in the atmosphere, is my understanding. And that, that's an issue. And so depending, that be there. depending on which, that, that's one big difference. Depending on the greenhouse gas. Some greenhouse gases have a, long, have a longer longer life in, in, in the atmosphere than others. Uh, that is to say, um, so for example, um, there are some folks that argue um, it doesn't get a lot of traction, it's not done uh, politically, uh, but there's some folks that argue that, that in the short to medium term, the way you get your biggest bang for your buck with greenhouse gases is ignoring carbon dioxide and dealing with methane because 
um, uh, you can, uh, it, it, is, it is a more powerful greenhouse gas and, and you, there are a lot of, arguably a lot more low hanging fruit. Um, but there is a real potential uh, in the climate change context of spending a lot of money trying to do a lot of things, you know, regulating a million plus buildings, restaurants, churches, apartment buildings, malls, casinos, what have you, uh, and not developing the sorts of technologies that would, and this is realistically what we're talking about, convince China that adopting those technologies makes more sense than simply developing the way they're developing and, and, and utilizing their massive coal deposits. And if, that, and if we don't achieve that, then everything we spend on reducing greenhouse gas emissions from a climate change standpoint is wasted. And so that the threat of doing it and getting something far more expensive and getting no environmental benefit for it is huge. And that's, that, that risk is huge. Uh, and I don't think it's a risk that's taken seriously enough. Um, you know, that, and uh, this is one of the reasons why I think talking about domestic limits that other countries aren't going to adopt and that we're not even going to achieve, we don't know how to achieve, but that would be incredibly costly, makes no sense. We should be, if, if we're going to focus on this, we should be focusing on the end game. How is it that we could talk, deal with, with having much, much lower emissions or, and some people talk about this, um, it's not as popular in some groups because it doesn't involve the same regulatory uh, sorts of regulatory initiatives, finding ways of simply sucking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And there are scientists that believe that that's actually doable. That you could not simply uh, take carbon dioxide out of emissions of power plants. So carbon capture is often talked about with the coal plant. You could capture the carbon dioxide uh, at, at, from a coal plant as burnt, burn, but there are folks that believe uh, that we're not very far away from literally being able to set up facilities that would, on their own, reduce carbon concentrations in the atmosphere far more quickly than, say, natural processes do. Um, uh, and you know, something like that might work. People need, we're nowhere near there, that yet. And if, we're, if the goal is dealing with carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere, we should be talking about how would we do that, not how do we regulate in ways that aren't going to have a meaningful effect. <coughs> To what do you attribute the apparent naivete of the American people and so many of them believing that these proposed reductions would be beneficial? I don't, well, I mean a couple of things. I mean, one, there actually there's a lot. There's a lot of that. I mean, the sorts of things that Congress has been proposing, like the cap and trade bill that passed the House, aren't popular. Um, uh, and, um, with some people, they're not popular because there are some people that don't believe climate change. Either they don't believe it's a threat or they don't believe it's a big threat, and they're, it's really not worth that sort of thing. And then there are a lot of people, uh, like myself, who are willing to believe it's a threat, but look at that bill and say, its goals don't solve the problem. It won't be able to achieve its goals. It will create a regulatory monstrosity that will never go away. And Produce no environmental in some cases will actually produce environmental harms. I mean, some of the things that 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 bill would require um, will will contribute or exacerbate other environmental problems. Um, you know, I think um, look, there there are a lot of people that that are always willing to believe every environmental problem is a catastrophe. There are a lot of people that are always willing to believe that if you just tell industry what to do, it'll do it. Um, and it's the you know the technology and, and solutions are kind of like magic, and it just is, requires political will to mandate. It. I don't uh, believe that. I don't know if people can have enough economics education or what, but I don't know. There are a lot of folks that believe that regulating industry more tightly and reducing the reuse of fossil fuels is good in and of itself. Uh, and have said so. Um, and kind of take the position that, well, you know, being more energy efficient and burning less coal is good for, well, burn less coal, there are other, other emissions from coal that that even though they're, they're controlled quite heavily by regulation now, still could contribute to health problems, and that'd be good in itself. Or energy efficiency would be good in and of itself. Um, uh, and so, you know, certainly for some people, it's, well, this is doing the things sorts of things you want to do anyway. Um, uh, uh, Tim Worth very famously said this uh, uh, years ago when he was still a senator, um, uh, very explicitly. And, and so certainly some folks believe that. Um, uh, but I think that most people that have actually looked at the scale of the problem uh, don't buy it. And that's true of people like James Hansen, who's a prominent scientist at NASA, who, do, who does believe that, that climate change is an utter catastrophe ecologically. But he looks at the things that are on the table and he says, 
you know, this, this, these, are, these are jokes. These aren't serious policies. Um, uh, he actually supports a kind of a tax and rebate system. Like, right? he, he would like the tax to be a lot higher probably than I would. But the idea of having it be revenue neutral, having it be essentially shifting taxes away from income towards consumption um, as a way of, of creating incentives uh, <coughs> is something that enforces as something that will at least have a prospect of, of moving us in the right direction. But, so there are some possibilities, but you know, at the end of the day, I, I can't look into people's heads and know for sure precisely why. But. Yeah? So how would you respond to the argument that the legislatures that are actually putting some of these proposals out there on the table now they know they're ridiculous, but that's because the environmental benefit's not their real goal. I mean, the way I, I saw an interesting survey that asked a bunch of uh, <coughs> global warming, Armageddon, catastrophe, Al Gore style, if it turned out that it was uh, not man-made, but that by implementing some of these um, solutions, we would be able to still fix it, would you still be in support? And a majority of the response said no. And that leads me to believe that the, the real goal here is not environmental benefit, but just another way of controlling human activity and increasing the, the scope of the federal government. And, and so I'm sure there are some people who have that. But do I think that that really explains it all? No. Um, uh, uh, yeah, there are, but when you look at behavior of, of, of states, but it is interesting, for example, there, I mentioned these nuisances that were filed, the one in the Second Circuit, um, American Electric Power versus, versus Connecticut, which has a decent job going to the Supreme Court, um, uh, which, a case which sat in the Second Circuit for some, you guys look at it, Mr. Charlie, look at it if you got this. The case was filed before Massachusetts versus EPA and sat for years before being released. Uh, it was, it was our, the oral argument, I believe, was in 2006. Um, it was released last year. Uh, one of the judges on the panel was then Second Circuit Judge Sonia Sotomayor, uh, and the opinion was released about two months after she was confirmed. Um, and uh, uh, so, I mean, it was it was it was a difficult case. It was a large case. It was a case that has huge impacts. That case involved suits by a bunch of New England states and a handful of uh, nonprofits against. The five largest emitters in the United States as companies. Technically, it's six, but one of them is a holding company for one of the others, so it's essentially five largest emitters. Um, these are all companies that don't have facilities in the states that are suing. And you talk to people in the, in, in, in the coal industry, and they look at that and they say, yeah, well, it's really easy for Connecticut to sue us if our facilities are in Ohio and Indiana and Illinois and so on. And to me, that's not. Uh, you know, that's not nefarious in the sense that, you know, Connecticut's trying to impose controls. It's really easy to talk about imposing lots of reductions if you're not imposing them on yourselves. And so most of what states have done to date are either things that can be justified on their grounds or things that impose, insofar as they impose costs, those costs are externalized. California, when California is really aggressive, for example, on adopting vehicle emission standards, it knows that other states are going to follow suit and that California is not going to bear the brunt of the cost of those sorts of rules. It knows that it generates barrel, relatively little electricity within California, so that if it adopts lots of controls in Cal within the state, that it's actually not going to have the sort of effects on out-of-state producers that, um, or on the actual producers of a lot of the electricity that California uses. I think that dynamic is common, right? That politicians wanting to, to say, well, look at all what we're doing, but, but, but either doing things that are symbolic or doing things that impose costs on people elsewhere, people that don't get the vote. Um, uh, and what? Yeah, I mean, it, well, the other thing I, I think is a lot of symbolism. I mean, in Europe, you know, talked a lot about, oh, we're going to have this big cap, we're going to have this big mission trading regime for Europe, and it's going to be great. And then what did they do? Well, they doled out far more permits uh, than were ne than, than uh, uh, were necessary given given the than industry needed. And oh, so lo and behold, you know, it, it, they, they were able to do that, but it didn't reduce emissions because they gave out too many permits. Why did they give out too many permits? Well, because when confronted with the prospect of actually imposing those costs, they blinked. The only reductions you've gotten in Europe are from things like uh, the modernization of former East Germany. A lot of emission reductions there, but that's because you were just 
going from either just shutting down incredibly inefficient Soviet era or Soviet, you know, Soviet technology facilities in, in, in East Germany or um, modernizing them as they got taken over by West German companies. Um, you had dramatic reductions in, in the United Kingdom if you used 1990 as your baseline because they got rid of their coal subsidies. And they, you know, they stopped subsidizing them. Economically, that made a lot of sense. I mean, not subsidizing stuff is generally a good, a good policy. Um, but it's not as if they actually had to, to, to swallow their, their own medicine. And um, Europe's now saying they're going to do another round of permits in their trading system. And this time, it's going to be different. But um, you know, when you have Germany, you know, just in 2008, greenlighting 20 new coal-fired power plants, it's hard to to, to believe, it's hard, it's hard to take seriously the claims that this time they're going to be that much more serious. And I think it's you know, posturing and, and, and willing to endorse things that, that externalize costs, but not, not willing to endorse things that actually bite. Um, uh, and, and that will be true until it's less expensive, much less expensive to do. Yep. Going back to the expense issue, <clears throat> and I accept the thesis that regulation is not necessarily the best way to excuse me, meet the salutary effects of making the climate change. I'm wondering if you see any kind of a role for government in seeding development. For example, space program, the last 50 years, probably the single largest spawning ground for scientific in invention that we've seen. Internet was a government um, deal for communications, and then private industry stepped in took the discoveries from the space program, took the internet and took it to another level. Do you see any role in government to somehow come up with some kind of an act project or some kind of a project that would see the spawning ground for these kinds of developments so that industry could then take it and see a profit opportunity to go forward? Yes and no. I mean, it would, there are examples of the government saying we have a specific goal precise way of doing it and we're going to, you know, we're, we're just going to spend money until we achieve that goal in doing it. Um, and that often produces incidental benefits since we discover, you know, we discover tang and we discover, you know, other things like when we're trying to the space program. Um, Teflon, I guess, I think was, came out of the space program. A lot of the computing capability um, was necessary. But, but when you compare that to what's generated privately by R&D investment, it's, it's, it's nothing. I mean, and, and, and what we don't see examples of, and we've seen investment in this, we don't see examples of government saying, I want a commercially viable product that does X, funding it and achieving it through traditional R&D expenditures. The closest we have to examples of that, historically, uh, are prizes. So I do support government funding prizes. So the, the, the climate change technology program, or climate change research program, Climate Change Technology <coughs> Research Program, I think that's what it's called, uh, has a list of the sorts of technologies that would be good to have if we're serious about climate change. And they've you know, categorized them in terms of you know, what's a carbon sequestration technology, what's an energy efficiency technology, what's a, and so on. What's a short-term goal, what's a medium-term goal, long-term goal defined in you know, pretty long-term for political purposes. So short-term is like in the next 20 years, medium-term 20 to 40 years, long-term beyond that. Um, I would have no problem with taking a large portion of the money we're spending on that now, using that same matrix of goals, but instead of giving it to people up front saying, here, please go spend this wisely and solve this problem, instead holding it out. If we took you know, half of the, the net, pre net present value of the money we're going to spend on energy-related R&D over the next 10 years and divide it up to prizes and prizes saying, whoever solves these problems, here's what you get, we'd have a lot of innovation. And um, you know, and 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 yes, government. The handful of government agencies for whom encouraging innovation is really, really important have actually figured this out. So the one government agency that's historically been good at using the prizes, does anybody know? DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research, Defense Advanced Research. Uh, I forget. Okay, but this is the the really all really cool, super high tech stuff that the Defense Department funds, and they use prizes and contests all the time. Private sector uses them. Um, and before we had uh, uh, the sort of kind of political investment in science that we do today, that governments used to do that. So I'm, I fully support that. Um, because I do think that there are public good aspects of, of climate change. 
And then, you know, traditional economic theory would tell us if you have a public good, the way you solve that public good is you or, or ensure that it's provided adequately is you subsidize. Um, but you want it subsidized in a way that you have reason to believe is actually going to produce returns. And the longitude story, I think, is so instructive because England knew what it needed. But if England funded that the way we tend to fund energy R&D in this country, they never would have solved the problem. Because it was some guy that everybody thought was crazy that actually solved the problem. And if you think about the big technological jumps we get all the time, right? The Bill Gates of the world, or Steve Jobs, or whichever one of them was doing it in his dad's garage. I mean, it's, it's real innovation is is groundbreaking because it, it's unexpected, and that means you can't have a bunch of people up ex ante saying, "Well, this lab does good work. We'll give this money to this lab, and they'll solve that problem for us." You rather need to find a way to draw out the people that have those ideas. I mean, innovation is more decentralized like that. So, so in a way, yes, I support government intervention. But I think it has to be done in a way that, that actually maximizes the chance of getting what we would, we would want. And, and that's the way that, that, um, that I would do it. Um, I should say, you know, that the parts of my university that get lots of government money <laughs> don't like me saying it. But um, you know, the, the things that, that we can justify R&D money on are not the thing, traditional R&D, are not the things that tend to be the source of innovations that we're looking for. Time for one more, or is there one more? If not, well then thank you very much.